So we just thank you for this time. We ask your blessing, God, that um, you're going to help us uh, as we talk about these things, and particularly as we talk tonight about the um, key principle of power and form, the key concept, Lord, that every premise of every religion has its own form of government. And so, God, we just pray that you'd help us keep our minds alert, help us to be clear. And God, we thank you that um, you, you, Lord, are going to help us in understanding this and, and obviously apply it as we see the things that are going on in our world today. So God, we thank you. We ask your blessing now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, um, are, uh, now moving into lesson four, and um, this lesson, uh, very interestingly, when we talk about lesson four, and I'm just gonna come back here for one second here, and, um, and then get this squared away. But lesson four, we're talking about comparative political systems. Uh, it sounds very daunting, and it can be, because um, when, we, when we speak about these things, it can get very technical, and I'm trying to keep it to the, the principled level. And so as I advance these slides, I want to just uh, once again start by uh, reviewing just a little bit. Uh, these are some of the presuppositions we have emphasized to date. We're going to begin consolidating them. I'm not going to end up having three slides of review by the time we end, but I'm just going to kind of consolidate. We've just said the Bible, of course, is the ultimate standard for truth, and um, that, is, that is critical. Also, we've said this, that the scriptures make it very clear because Jesus said he was the light of the world, and then he said we are the light of the world when his life comes into us. The darkness cannot conquer where light prevails. And this brings up a, a, various, a very important point, and that is if we see darkness conquering, there's not a problem with the light. As Russ would say in the book, it's the problem with the light bearer. And that's been the issue that we've had the challenge with believers. We are dual citizens. We are citizens of heaven and also citizens of earth, citizens of heaven first, and then citizens of our nation which means we have a responsibility to heaven, and we also have a responsibility to earth. Very critical to keep that in mind and remind ourselves of that. Uh, we, uh, and a lot of times the problems we've had in, in this country particularly, of course it would work in any other nation, is that Christians have been so heavenly minded, they have been not earthly good. In other words, they have lost their citizenship responsibilities to the culture. And we talked about how civil government is God's ministry of justice. It's ordained by God for that purpose. And when it does not fulfill that purpose, we recognize that though we have an attitude of submission toward authority, there may come a time when we are commanded to disobey God and must disobey submissively in our attitudes. We also talked about the fact that the culture is a reflection of God's people. Now, it's usually separated in my study of history by at least a generation, but the idea is the culture we have today is actually a reflection of the people of God 30 or 40 years ago. And that's a hard one because uh, we either change the culture or we are so salty the culture martyrs the believers. But it's a, an important point to look at. We get very angry at the corruption we see today. But we have to recognize that God's intent is going to be to expose that same corruption in us especially in believers. We've seen that the flow of governmental authority and power begins with God in the heart of the individual and the heart of the believer. So the quality, the source of that power is critical. The pilgrims set an example of self-government. We talked a bit about them. And the patriots advanced its liberty. And we're going to talk a bit more about that this time, especially the role of the patriots and the role of the clergy previous to the American Revolution. But first, let's lay down this premise and principle. In the paperback book called Facts that you, you have, or some of you have there, um, Russ Walton identifies this chapter uh, as from the inside out. The idea is the source determines the quality. Think of Jesus' phrase, which has tremendous pervasive truth. A tree is known by its fruit. In other words, what kind of fruit is it? I remember uh, years ago, this comes out of Matthew 12, 33, 
but we recognize the following. They say, well, someone can say all day long, I'm a Christian, I confess the right doctrine, I believe in the Bible, but isn't their character going to determine whether, they, whether you really like the fruit or not? Uh, it's not going to be, you can have all the confession you want, but the tree will bear fruit, and uh, you'll be known by your fruit. Wouldn't that be the same, same true with nations? Wouldn't the nation demonstrate by its fruit? Uh, and we're seeing some ugly seeds that were planted in American history, the sin of slavery, the sin of the mistreatment of the American Indian. These are things that we will touch on in this course and see that the sins also bear fruit, and they bear fruit in the culture. And um, the weeds, the wheat and the tares grow up together. But you see, from what we're talking about here, I remember someone challenged me and they just said, well, gee, Christianity was not the root of the United States Constitution. It was not the root of the Declaration of Independence. And they wanted to pick a debate. And I listened and I, I asked them this question. I said, well, what religion do you think founded America? And they, they said, well, it's, it's got to be the Jesuits. It's got to be the radical Catholics whom the Catholics didn't even like back then. And I said, well, wait a minute. Let me just ask you this. Um, would that radical group of the Jesuits who believed in conversion by force, who believed in a top-down centralized government, we didn't get that kind of constitution. If they, their ideas were the root, we'd have a different form of government. Now, do you follow that reasoning? Do you follow what I'm saying? If, if that was the case, uh, and we can make this, this case, it, along this slide, we say not all structures of civil government are equal. Some are better than others. Power and form are related. The source and the quality are critical. And here's another point that we could make. Every religion has its corresponding form of civil government. Does it protect liberty or does it enforce the law in the sense of forcing you to believe something? You see, religions have different forms of government. They initially are forms of church government, whatever kind of church they have, but that becomes the model for civil government. It works from the inside out, from the bottom up. And we often make this statement when I teach on uh, universal or world history, I will make this statement to the students or to individuals taking the course. I'll say the most influential religion in a nation can be discerned by the form of the civil government. So I will take students and I will say, all right, let's talk about the form of government. Are there many rights? No, rights are all government granted in this form of government. Suppose we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about Assyria, we're talking about Babylon, we're talking about some ancient kingdom. And I'll say, well, if, if there are no God-given rights, if all power is centralized at the top and, and whatnot, well, then we can discern what the roots are, the most influential religious ideas. It doesn't mean the only religion there, but it's the most influential one because the fruit the form of government will be reflective of the root. And that is critical to understand. Our government is changing, and it's changing fast. We see it all before us uh, in, in ways that uh, we, uh, it's a reaction right now to change the external form, to change how we do things. And that's because of the most influential ideas that are flowing around in the streets right now. And they're not necessarily all good, but the idea is, it's, it's, it's how this is determined. I put that little tree there because the roots, the source of the root is the most influential religion. But the quality of the fruit is the liberty under law. Now, the reason I use a fruit, and I also, I like to use a tree like this, because the parable that Jesus said is that um, um, like a mustard seed, Christianity is planted and it grows up to be a large tree that shades all the fowls of the air. Now, all the fowls of the air is a phrase you can research in Scripture to deal with all the ideologies of the age, or all the ideologies. See, what kind of, of shade does the civil government give? Uh, and this is going to be just a thought in this. Now, I'm going to use a couple of charts here. That may seem a bit complex, but we'll go section by section in this. Um, the Hebrew Republic which is a phrase given to 400 years of Israel's history in the Old Testament. It precedes, it's the 400 years that precede the um, asking for a king on, on Samuel's reign. Now, I want you to look at the box to the left. I'm gonna move my arrow up there. This box up here, you'll, know, you'll notice the following. 
that the Old Testament Israelite government was called a republic under the rule of law. This is Old Testament government now. I don't have time to just go through all the scriptures, but I'll, I'll talk to you. Moses, uh, by the way, the Reformation termed kingdom government the one, the few, and the many. A blend of three forms of government. The one we could call Episcopalian, the few Presbyterian, and the many congregationalism in America. But in the Old Testament law, Moses <clears throat> was the one. But then in Exodus 18, a, uh, representatives were elected in Exodus uh, chapter 18, and this became representative government. It was added to Moses. And then there were senators, 70 senators, senators which the Hebrew word, by the way, for prince in Numbers 11 is the Hebrew word for senator. That's why Thomas Jefferson was so adamant to that we should use the word senator, even though it had been uh, uh, very, very much maligned because of Roman Republic, which became an empire. But you have this threefold, one few in the many. You have the representative of people. You have the indirect representation in the tribes. These were all the leaders of tribes in Numbers 11. And you had this Republican form of government. It's not a direct democracy. It is a checks and balances. But if you look at the bottom, that's another added thing in ancient Israel. It had federalism. Each tribe was sovereign and then delegated a certain amount of power to the national government. Uh, it's interesting because there were two tables of the law. If you look at the central box, church and state were separate. First four commandments involved the uh, church. The last six involved the state. Now the church was the priesthood in scripture. Now for a time, all 10 commandments had the uh, death penalty because it was a holy nation. But this is not uh, the way when God, the covenant was given to Noah after the flood, civil government started with capital punishment for murder, the second, the, the next six commandments. You find in the New Testament that uh, civil government deals with those six areas of the, of the Ten Commandments. You notice in the Old Testament, the priest could not don the civil gar garment. If you were a priest, you could not act as a priest in leading the state. Uh, do you notice also that uh, when this happened, Saul, remember Saul was waiting for Samuel, and he was upset, and so Saul donned the priest's garments. Well, God got very upset because he was mixing the jurisdiction of church and state. That's the seed of religious liberty, folks. It's the seed that the state is not sovereign over everything. And the, uh, the church, the priesthood, was separate. So even that's in Exodus 19 and 20. It's formed in the ancient Hebrew Republic. The flow of power was from God directly to the people. Do you realize that in Exodus 19, I'll never forget this phone call with Russ Walton, when he said to me, Paul, he was trying to, he was schooling me on government. And uh, he said to me, Paul, do you know that God asked the people of Israel to vote him in as sovereign? I was dead quiet on the phone. I said, are you kidding me? He said, yes. If you read Exodus 19, verses 5 through 7, 5 through 10 of that, and you listen to it carefully, you will see very clearly that God asked. Now, now if the people didn't vote God in, it didn't mean God was out. It means that was a pretty foolish move for the people. But the idea was God wanted to rule by consent. This is what makes Christianity so unique. False gods, we call them false because they're different from Christianity, but when you look at the other, other gods, they, they rule fiat, and God says he wants our consent. He wants our volition. This is the amazing thing about it, and yet there's something involved in this. For 400 years now, this liberty, and we're going to see what the fruit is in the next slide, of what happened in those 400 years. But I'll tell you that the, the whole period, almost all that period is called the period of the judges. The book of Judges is about 310, 20 years out of that 400 years. And the amazing part about it is this is about the only verse that Christians know. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did was right, what was right in their own eyes. Now, first of all, this does not condone having kings. It didn't say, oh, well, the answer is to bring a king and have divine right of kings and have no liberty. No. This was a declaratory statement. When you lose self-government, what's going to increase? Civil government. And when the loss of self-government at the end of those 400 years, the people rose up and demanded a king like all the nations. So the form of government in Israel changed when the people no longer wanted the responsibility of maintaining liberty. In fact, throughout the 400 years, the people proved they were not capable 
of conducting their their um, the idea that they were going to be able to conduct self-government. In fact, they wanted them to judge judge us like all the nations. And then God said, they have not rejected you, Samuel. What did he say? They've rejected me. They rejected, when they reject my form of government, they reject me. Why? Because when we look at the fruit of the Hebrew Republic, let's just take a quick stroll. Now, because I teach on this, I compare this with every ancient empire. I mean, you could go on through the empires, from the pyramids of Egypt to Assyria to Babylon to Persia. Persia adopted some and borrowed some from the Jews. But the Hebrews had this unique form of government, and this is what happened. They had individual liberty with God-given rights, of life, liberty, and property. This was clear in Israel for these 400 years, but not in any other nation on earth. They were the only nation on earth that had individual liberty. They were the only nation on earth that had political equality. Where before the law, all people, including immigrants that had entered the nation legally and come into the nation and been grafted in, were considered equal before the law, but with every native-born Israelite. Do you know that Israel was never a, 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 a homogeneous ethnic group? It was always multiracial, we might say, today's terminology. Or it could be, it was always multi-ethnic. Because God has said, whosoever will, you come from any nation. And when you did, the stranger was to be treated with the exact same rights as the citizen in Israel. When they grafted in, they come in the right way. Also, they were the only nation in all of antiquity that had elected representatives, accountable to the people at large. Well, this is not known. I was on a, a call, a national Bible study call. I had individuals from Africa, individuals from different continents on the Bible study call. And I remember in the question and answer, a pastor came up and said to me, and I'd made this point, and he said, I was always taught in seminary that the, that the biblical form of government was for people never to vote. It was only the leaders that voted, not the people. Can you show me any verse of scripture where people voted? So I went through in Exodus and Deuteronomy with him on the phone to recognize that, no, the Bible is clear about this, and yet this is a massive history lesson we've lost. Now, it's important to set this stage for what we're going to talk about in a minute. If you look over on economic liberty, you see on the box on the right, economic liberty because there was private property. Do you know that there was private property in Israel? That's why you had borders for the tribes. You had borders for your home. You owned a farm. You, you, you farmed the land. God was the owner of the land, but the land was never to be taxed. Uh, we could go to a lot of details in the Old Testament government. But land, because it was the Lord, was never to be taxed because it was always to be a dynasty. You could send it down to your children and your children's children. But the idea of impartial justice, swift and inexpensive, bottom-up appeals of justice, this is all taught to us in the book of Deuteronomy on how you judge a situation. And universal education, think about it. The literacy rate in Israel was the highest of any ancient empire. In fact, the parents taught their children the Hebrew alphabet at age five, then they could read. And I, and I want to tell you something else, too. And this has been now proven scientifically. Israel was the first nation on earth to have an alphabetic language, an alphabetic uh, characters from Hebrew. Where did they learn it? They learned it when God carved out the Ten Commandments on those tables of stone. That was the first time alphabetic language. If you study it, you recognize everything else was pictorial. You had uh, pictorial. And I know I was taught, you were probably taught too. We all had pictographs in our world history textbooks and, and how language was about that. But what was left out was there was one nation whose literacy exploded because they actually had letters on their alphabet. And that meant they were more creative and could, could spell and to, and to sound out letters in the Hebrew alphabet and learn to read. And that was Israel. And... Um, but again, the loss of self-government, look at what Israel gave up when they took on a king. Look at what they gave up. They didn't give up everything because God was merciful. But they were going to give up this maximum liberty because they don't want the responsibility. And here's what's going to happen. I'll, you know, I can take a quick commercial break because I always get this question at this point. Where did you come up with this stuff? How did you learn this? Well, it was Russ Walton that introduced me to the commentaries on the laws of the ancient Hebrews. It's about a, this book on the left is about a 650 page treatise on every law in the Old Testament on how it was formed into a government. However, 
because we didn't do that. Plymouth Rock Foundation, the book on the right, Roots of the American Republic, is a digest, a very easily read book on how Old Testament government, the nation of Israel, was the model used for the United States Republic. And so those Roots of the Republic, E.C. Wines was a pastor. He wrote in the 1800s, late 1800s, and he believed in the 1860s after the Civil War that America had forgotten her Christian heritage. And therefore, he compiled this massive treatise to demonstrate that no, it was not the Greeks that gave us our governmental form. It was not the Romans who gave us our governmental form. It was the Israelites. It was God. And therefore, I just had put this phrase, the United States has its roots in Jerusalem, not in Athens or Rome. And it's important to recognize that. So uh, back to our, uh, our text, you'll notice when you read in the text and you read in the notebook and you read also in the facts paperback book, that Russ Walton goes through the warnings that Samuel gave to the children of Israel. If you change to a king, the power is going to flow from the top down. It's no longer going to be from the bottom up. Not only that, you're going to be sorry. You're going to ask for something different. Now, of course, we, we never get the government we deserve. Folks, could you imagine we do not deserve the government we have? It's better than we deserve. Trust me. God's mercy is evident. 1 Samuel 8.10 and Deuteronomy 17 tell us that God put limits on the king. He would not let the king be like all the other nations that had total power. This is what God said about the king in Israel. He must be God's choice. In other words, it was put to the fear of the people that, man, when you look at this, it's going to have to be God's choice. Well, of course, the people didn't always choose God's choice, but that's what we should do. And the sacredness of elections is when we go into a voting booth, we need to be praying, what is your choice, God? And then we affirm his choice. But then he said this, there was never to be a standing army. The king was never to amass such a military that it could turn on the people. The king must always resist immorality. Ah, we know kings didn't do that. Because when power goes to the head, it corrupts universally. And, and to refuse government wealth. See, the government was not to amass wealth. And all this begins to happen when they choose a king, even though this is against God's decree. And now, I think this is really good. The king has to read and write, personally copy the entire law every seven years. Now, I think... Every president of the United States should be made to copy the entire Constitution, letter by letter. It wouldn't take them that long. And then to have constitutional scholars that actually teach from the Federalist Papers instruct the president in the first week in office what it really means. Now, nobody's listening to me on that. I just am saying that's my concept of it. I think we'd be better off. But that concept is given in the Old Testament. Now, verse 11 says that uh, if you read through 1 Samuel 8, that he will appoint your children to fight in unjust wars. See, the moment you have more power in government, government starts wars in order to have uh, more taxes and everything else, and they're not always just. And thus, it turns foreign policy into aggression. Samuel warned, and he said, you're going to have a larger government, and you're going to have bureaucratic workers. They work in kitchens. They work in government farming. They would compete with the free market. See, the government was never ordained by God to compete in the free market because it was, doesn't produce goods and services. So here, here Samuel is saying, listen, if you do this and you choose a king, the government's going to start hiring people that you did not elect. That's called a bureaucratic shadow government. I wonder if we have such a government today. <laughs> I'm being very facetious. The bureaucratic government's bigger than the elected one. And because of that, that's, this is what Samuel is saying in 1 Samuel 8. He says, you're going to get an income tax. And you see, the income tax is not biblical because the only one that gives us a percentage of what to give is God. God alone gives the tithe, not government. You were to be given an equal amount, regardless of your income. The idea of a, uh, of a percentage of your income, your produce to give in, is income tax. And this Samuel said, you're going to be sorry for this. Now, uh, no, there's no wonder, by the way, that Russ Walton, in your book and materials, puts a parallel between 1 Samuel 8's warnings and the Declaration of Independence and the colonists' warning about the King of Great Britain, who'd violated these. But you see, we're not ta taught these in seminary anymore. 
Christians aren't taught that the Bible has specific instruction about civil government, has specific instruction on the limits of civil government and, and what it should be doing and shouldn't do. And that, uh, by the way, the last warning he gives in articulation is government will end up doing what you should be doing. Now, this is the key thing. Most government grows, even at the local level in towns, if you go to your town meetings, if people don't want to pack up their trash and go to the dump themselves, the government does it. They pick up the trash, but your taxes go up. If the people don't want to do certain things, they end up with the government doing it. There's nothing wrong necessarily with the government picking up trash, but the idea is you don't want the government to start doing all the things that you're responsible for doing. And that's what Samuel's saying. Listen, be careful. So these warnings now come in. Well, what happens of this? Well, the summary of Old Testament government then could be like this. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 5, beware of a form of godliness when you deny its power. You see, we have a form of the godliness of our original constitution. We have the form of it. It's still there. A lot of it is still there. The amendments have watered it down a bit, and we're not always functioning by it. Someone said to me the other day, they just said, oh, Dr. Chaley, I, I don't think they're following the constitution. They haven't been following the constitution for decades. But the point is, it's a form of godliness. But when you deny the root, you're going to end up losing the fruit you will end up, the form changes as a result of rejecting its origin. This is the key point of this. When you reject God, and now, by the way, this is just historic and it's biblical. What did Old Testament Israel do? Well, they rejected God, and that was a loss of self-government and liberty. Then they mixed godly and ungodly ideas called syncretism. They mixed foreign worship and pagan worship with godly worship. They compromised. The, the people did, and the leaders, God's standards and laws. They ignored God's laws. It led to division. It led to a civil war. Israel then became a divided kingdom, and they went into captivity. Folks, if you look at this progression, I teach this from Old Testament government, but when you look at it, where are we as Americans? Where are we as a nation? We've rejected God a long time ago. Syncretism abounds in churches, out of churches, in our culture. Compromise from God's standards is commonplace. Division is everywhere, and it's becoming more marked. The only thing left is we will go into captivity like any other nation unless God moves in our hearts, and there's a remnant that rise up of believers that understand these truths and understand cause and effect. Folks, it's a deep repentance that's required in the body of Christ because our lack of responsibility is contributing to this slide. The law operates now from the outside, of course. It, in the Old Testament, exposure of sin, it has a positive role. Purpose of the law is to drive us to Christ. We, to all have sinned. The conclusion of the Old Testament is we had a godly form, but there was no power without Christ. You know, the whole conclusion of the Old Testament is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't do self-government the way we are intended to do but now we have Christ. What the law could not do, God did by sending his son, as Romans 8, 3 says. See, the idea is the law is not bad. The law is good, but the law is limited. The law only deals with external actions. It's the attitudes that get tra transformed by Christ when Christ comes and lives within. And this leads us to the form of New Testament government. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a look at this. When the, the form of New Testament government here, when we look at it, uh, is Christ in you, the hope of glory? Colossians 1.27. The new covenant rests on Christ in us. It's internal government. It, it's uh, internal governance. It inspires a measure of self-restraint in others. Do you know when Christians are given the responsibility to set the example of self-control? There's a lot of things I want to say. I'm glad I have mumbled things in front of my television lately and not said most of the things I've mumbled. Not because I'm swearing, but because I need self-control when I go out in public. I need to understand and discern. When do you speak? When are you silent? Uh, we need to model self-control because self-control is contagious. Others will pick it up. And this is why it's so important that Christians shine a light by our character, not just by our words. In fact, it's far better to live out your character five times more than you speak. 
As one person said, uh, people should know what you believe by how you act and sometimes use words. Because that's, that's how powerful example is. Well, this is what Russ Walton says in the facts paperback book, pages 108 to 109. The Christian methodology of government is self-government. The government set forth in the New Testament is Christ-centered. It radiates from the inside out. This Christian self-government is to be the source of the power and the flow. Good government, God-directed civil government, becomes an external expression, an extension of our Christ-centered internal government. So here you have it, that Christianity is unique. It's the, the only religion where the supreme ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes and lives inside his subjects. Think about it. No other kingdom has that. No other religion has that. We don't have to have things operating from the outside in. Now, the law is made for the unrighteous, and we need law to build the fear of God in us for areas where we disobey. The law is still positive and good. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. But we have government on the inside. It doesn't conflict with law. If you look at Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, it says, against such there is no law. God's law does not conflict with love, joy, long-suffering, peace, and righteousness. Of course not. It does conflict with sin, but it doesn't conflict with Christ because he came to fulfill the law. But government is now the inside out and the bottom up. Uh, think about this also, but what form would it take? You see, the historians and the theologians that wrote in the 1700s, and the 1800s about the history of Christianity. The reason they wrote those, like Moshim, and, uh, and uh, you have the universal history uh, volumes uh, of, of writings. And you have individuals in the 1800s who write about the origin of church government, not just in America, but the origin of church government in history. Why? Because how Christians governed themselves became the model for civil government, good and bad. In the first century, Christians were governed from the inside out and the bottom up. The people governed, and that's the way the government began to work. The Roman Empire began to change, the inside out. And yet, during the time of Constantine, the government in the churches began to be top-down, giving bishops control over more than one church. And pretty soon it became top-down. Guess what followed? The civil government followed it. You see, you have... Uh, historically, this responsibility. You and I have this. Now, we go on and we say this. This is where Edwin, uh, Edward Hall uh, was quoted in Christian History of the Constitution. I'll, I'll give you more about those red books and the sources from which this course is drawn uh, in a later, uh, later lesson. But uh, listen to this statement written in 1846. And he said, it's remarkable how men of comprehensive views and free from sectarian bias have agreed with regard to the republicanism of Christianity. Now keep in mind, when the word republic is used, it's not the Republican Party. We're talking about the Republican nature of the form that Christianity produces. There is a certain fruit that Christianity produces in the way of government, both in church and in state. Christianity, it goes on to say, says Montesquieu, now he's French, is a stranger to despotic power. See, Christianity and tyranny do not get along. The religion says de Tocqueville, he's from France too, he's the journalist that came over in the 1830s, which declares that all are equal in the sight of God, will not refuse to acknowledge that all citizens are equal in the eye of the law. Let me pause that. Do you see his reasoning? De Tocqueville said this, if you believe God created all people, regardless of whether they're a Christian, and they're equal in the eyes of God, then they will follow that your government will make them equal in the eyes of what? The law. If you reason that from your religious premise, you're going to get it in the civil sphere. So therefore, we say this, that he goes on, religion is the companion of liberty in all its battles and all its conflicts, the cradle of its infancy and the divine source of its claims. Christianity, in its essence, its doctrines and its forms is Republican. Now, again, not Republican Party. It means a government that is decentralized, bottom up, under the rule of law, that has God given rights, all spelled out in the Old Testament clearly. So, when we take a look at this, we can see there's a scale to government. What do you mean by a scale? 
Well, what are the two extremes of government? Now, if I would take you to a political science course in a college, or I take you to political science, this is what would happen. On the left-hand column where I have anarchy would be fascism. And on the right-hand column would be dictatorship or communism. And this is the way it's normally taught today, where fascism is, is on the left and on the right, so to speak, not the right and left wing, but the idea is you have tyranny. Well, that's wrong. You have either on one extreme, you have no government, that's anarchy. Now, do, do you understand that the violence in our streets is asking for no government? And do you realize that that asking for no government, that's not what you get. In fact, you get total government. Now, here's my point. If you look on the left-hand column for a moment, the basic form of both church and civil government in the middle now in scripture is a republic, decentralized government by consent under the rule of law. But anarchy, no government, well, you see, the, the religions of Asia that were tremendously powerful in Shintoism, Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, all of these religions are very, very close to the people. They're, they're, they're dealing with genealogies. They deal with uh, ancestry. They deal with families. In fact, Asia was an empire that idolized the family. All your mates were chosen uh, from uh, early on before you ever met them. They were family dominated. Now these empires, it appears that these religions would be very close to the people, very similar to that. But let me tell you something. Anarchy is never permanent. And close to anarchy is democracy. Democracy is only, is only one step away from anarchy. It's the rule by the majority. And you can get a majority to change. I remember a, a teacher taught me an analogy I used in the classroom. And I said this, well, why don't we take a vote of the 12 students in the classroom as to whether one student should pass or fail my course? I'm going to give you a piece of paper, and I'm going to fold it together. And I'm going to, I'm going to say, we'll go by the majority. Why do you suppose the student in the front row that I picked on does not want the majority of the class to determine their grade? They don't think it's going to be fair. Why should the majority rule? Aren't they under the rule of law? Shouldn't there be one standard for grading? And they're right, of course. Democracy does not work. The rule of the majority. You might have a democratic element in a government, but a pure democracy does not, as we'll see in a moment. But all of these religions begin to produce this de over decentralized form that comes close to this, but it quickly turns to tyranny. In fact, the, uh, the family dynasty becomes tyrannical. If you look, biblical Christianity is the only one that can maintain the balance. Look on the right-hand side. What about total government and the complete opposite? Well, the European empires idolized church and state. You had total government in the church. The Holy Roman Empire, you had total government in the state, uh, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, you had, and the Asian Empire is the family. But God has them all three in different separate jurisdictions. Think about it. The, the chart you're given in this lesson four in the notebook or chapter five in the uh, uh, paperback book, and then there's the appendix with this, it gives you all these definitions of aristocracy, oligarchy, plutocracy, technocracy. You see, an aristocracy is a rule by the privileged class. Oligarchy, rule by the wealthy. Plutocracy, rule by both the wealthy and the connected. A technocracy, rule by science. <clears throat> we, we're getting some of that. <laughs> we'll rule all of that, the privileged class, that's all a form of tyranny. Madison said it well. He said it, does, it could be one, the few or the many, but it's tyrannical when it's top down. Or autocracy, that's total dictatorship. Socialism, communism, ruled by the state. Atheism, Islam, all begin in some forms of Catholicism because of its centralized government, not Catholics. And that Catholics are, of course, closer to Christianity, but their premise is salvation by works, whereas in Protestant Christianity, it's salvation by grace. But the thing that we have to keep in mind here is the framers talked about this, and they, they recognized we have to be careful to discern the source in order to get the quality. I'm not against anyone who believes anything they want to believe. They can, they can believe it, but they need to understand where it leads. And that's the key thing. Think of this. John Adams put it this way. Much as I love, esteem, and admire the Greeks, and he was a student of the Greeks and the Romans, I believe the Hebrews have done more to enlighten and civilize the world. Moses did more than all their legislators and philosophers. They are the most, that means Israel, the most glorious nation that ever inhabited this earth. 
The Romans and their empire were but a bubble in comparison to the Jews. They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more than any other nation, ancient or modern. Now, how many of you learned that John Adams extolled the Jews as the origin of American government? Most people have never heard of that. They have no clue about that because he saw that. In fact, James Madison talked about the horrors of democracy. He said, a pure democracy, citizens who assemble and administer the government in person can admit of no cure for the mischief of faction. Such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. A republic promises the cure for which we are seeking. See, he recognized, he did made a clear distinction between a democracy and a republic. But yet, what do our children hear over and over again, that we were formed as what? A democracy, when that is not the case. Now, how do we conclude then this? I want to bring this in for a landing, so to speak, with this. Do you realize that all throughout the 1700s, actually beginning in the late 1680s, on through the 1770s and 80s in America, the colonial clergy in every colony preached in their churches that if we were to get the chance to form a new government in the United States, we should model it after ancient Israel before they chose a king. It was the most common analogy used by the colonial clergy. Keep in mind, they preached for two hours each Sunday morning and afternoon in addition, they preached all the artillery election sermons. That's when they were going to elect a captain over the militia. Then you put them outside the church on the green. And before they voted for the captain, the preacher came out and preached on a just war and who you sh the kind of person you should vote for. Not telling them who to vote for, but the kind of person. They had election sermons, every election, uh, annual election. And they had the Thursday lectures on current events. This was the key. Harry Stout, in his wonderful little book there, The New England Soul, documents that if you just went to church and listened to the weekly lectures of the pastor, you'd get three college educations by the time you turned 18, just by going to church. That's how in-depth these were. They taught on every feature of the Hebrew Republic. We can give you uh, sermons from the clergy that taught on God-given rights, separation of powers in government, bottom-up appeal system of judges, constitution as the covenant with God, political equality, electing representatives, all under the rule of law. It was all there. You know, when they asked Thomas Jefferson, where'd you get the ideas for the Declaration? He said it was part of the American mind. It's just what we heard from the pulpits. I'll give you two examples. In 1780, Samuel Cooper, who was the uh, pastor in Boston at Brattle Street Church, uh, and the part of the Committee of Safety, uh, when they inaugurated the Massachusetts State Constitution, I'll just, just real quickly, they rejected the first one in 1779 because it was not modeled after the Republic of the Israelites. So the pastors went out, which, and they were 15% of all the delegates for forming a constitution. They voted it down. So what did they have? Sam Adams, John Adams, James Bowden. They wrote a new constitution. And so what did they do? They had the most powerful patriot pastor preach an inaugural sermon when the Constitution of Massachusetts was put into effect, and they printed the entire sermon and sent it out with the Constitution for the people. And that sermon was the inauguration of the Mass State Constitution. And guess what Samuel Cooper said? We should use the Israelites as a model. Not only that, and up in New Hampshire, Samuel Langdon in 1788, when they were voting on the National Constitution, he, he, wrote, he preached an entire sermon saying the Republic of Israel is the example for the United States. So I'm not making this up. This is something that's clearly documented that they recognize. Now, we kind of come back to the simple premise. What is this? A tree is known by its fruit. Folks, the kind of government we have is unique in the earth. And that's because the seeds that were planted are unique. We're not, it's not, we're not good because we're great. It's because the seeds were great. And that was all glory to God, not us. The source of the flow has determined its quality. Every religion has a corresponding form of government. That's why when someone had come to me, I said only, I was giving a lecture before a lot of people who are patriots, but they didn't understand Christianity. And I said to them, the only religion that could have formed the kind of constitution we have is Christianity. And because the root determines the fruit, we get the government that we resemble.
applying this to the demand for change from the streets. We need to listen carefully to people because there's a lot of hurt. And we as Christians can't just jump on, on, on bandwagons. We need to listen and discern the source of the demands and the source of the true cry. There are people who are just demanding because they want control. Other people are truly hurting and need to be heard. Anarchy and lawlessness will reduce everyone's freedom, including the people who are running around committing those kinds of uh, violent acts. The sins of the past, they should be discussed in context of history, and we will. We need to recognize those. But the goal should be to teach our children to reason from premises. That's the critical thing. And not just to accept it. You know, when you when you reason through this and you, you you listen to this, I did not want to just go through the detailed chart with you. I categorize them. You can go back and look at them. I don't want this to be a complex lesson. But the roots of our republic, the article that I'm giving you for Russ Walton, will summarize E.C. Wines and the ancient Israel Republic. Ponder the comparison of the chart and the USA Today. These things are important for us because it's important for us to recognize that we might um, to the place where we say, Lord God, help us. Let us be thankful for the form of government. It's not perfect, but because of its root. And that's the simple idea, that there's the root and the fruit. So I've unmuted you all, and um, 